Hello, for lover, and thank you for choosing Once a Warrior. My name is Monte Beatham. I am Warrior Number 61. Now we're going to go back to a fan favourite of the early 2000s. He is Warrior Number 76, and he is Mark Tuki. Tuks, how are you, man? G'day, Monty. How are you, brother? I'm, I'm doing well. Well, look, I know where you are staying and what you've been up to because we played a game together with the old boys not so long ago. But for the people at home, can you fill us in, please? Yeah, mate. Back in Queensland, uh, living down on the Gold Coast, living the dream. You are living the dream, and you're about to get married soon to a Kiwi girl, mate. Fill us in some more. Yeah, Rachel uh, Palmer's the North girl. Um, yeah, we've been together for a while now, and, yeah, we're looking to get married. Uh, bloody COVID uh, stuffed us up the first time around. So, uh, yeah, we'll wait until her family can get over here to Australia and uh, celebrate with us. All the best with that, my man. Now, on social media, when we said that you were coming on, a man called Charlie Raj shared the photo of this. It is you beside your mini. Uh, he wanted to know what's happened with the mini. So, mate, I've, I've, I've uh, repainted the mini. I've done it up. I've spent way too much money on it. Um, but I've had to sell it through uh, a change of relationships. So uh, I actually ended up selling it to Chaz Mostart, the V8 supercar driver, his dad bought it off me, so yeah, yeah, it's gone to a real happy place, and I'm hoping to get another mini soon. Well, Charlie, I'm sure he'll it. be happy with that as well. But um, you know, you should have used <laughs> some of that money to pay for your computer, mate. How old is your computer? Because you've not even got one that falls out the full screen, toots. Mate, I don't need the full screen anymore. I used to need a full screen, but I don't need one anymore, mate. mate. All right, brother, this is a rugby league show, so let's go back to the days of here for me and when you had a little bit more weight that you were throwing around in that rugby league jumper that is the Warriors. Turkey, look at him go. Wonderful carry up field from the big fella. Turkey, he's still going. Turkey, great run. Now, beat them, fires a pass out to Turkey. Oh, spectacular start. Tuki. Well, there's straight up the middle, Mark Tuki. The Warriors are on fire, and it was Mark Tuki that started it. Oh, Tuki! The big man has come down with the ball. Mate, when you've seen that, uh, the memories that come back to you, how do you feel? Oh, mate, they're fun memories. Uh... Uh, it was a tough old lifestyle, um, the weight challenges with me weights and then things like that, but um, I wouldn't change it for the world, mate. I, I really enjoyed my time over in New Zealand and, and I'd love to go back and do it all again. The crowd over in New Zealand was second to none, uh, especially in, from my point of view. I, they really embraced me and um, I'm forever grateful for the supporters in New Zealand for sure, mate. Obviously, you came over from Parramatta when you had a cult following. And, and when I was a young guy through those that era, I was like, we didn't seem to get the pick of the best players. So when you came over, I thought, wow, I didn't think that would be a possibility. Uh, but neither did Brian Smith think it was going to be a possibility. You caught his bluff. Talk to me about that story. Yeah, mate, I went to training like any other normal day. And um, Brian Smith called me over and just said, mate, we're not going to renew your contract. Um, because with the interchange system going from unlimited where I could just come on and off, on and off, on and off, um, he then said that the game's going to pass me by. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I was kind of a bit worried. And I said, oh, so do I just go and um, not look for other offers? And he goes, yeah, be my guest, you know. Uh, but the game's going to pass you by. So, And I'm like, oh, okay. So I spoke to my manager and, and we're lucky enough to have a meeting with Hugh McGann um, down there on the shores of uh, the Sydney Harbour and um, yeah the rest is kind of history I uh, I agreed that I'd love to come over and have a look and, uh, and, I, and I'd like to sign with the Warriors and um, the club flew us over um, basically um, Trevor McEwen spoke to my manager and said go home, go back to the hotel, speak to Tukes about um, what's it going to take for him to sign before he goes back to Australia this weekend and I'm like whoa and they just said kind of you name it and we so we kind of got a car put in it and some contract and rent paid and stuff like that just so the transition was pretty easy but Brian Smith I mean you caught his bluff because I don't believe he wanted to go he's just trying to lowball you he actually wanted you to stay right yeah after the fact and I mean, we spoke you know, a couple of years later yeah he was trying to call <laughs> our bluff get me a bit cheaper thinking that I wouldn't leave the club I know uh, fan favourite and all that at Parramatta as well. So, um, yeah, it didn't work out, but, um, you know, for, for 
all those uh, reasons, uh, I ended up over in the, at the Warriors and absolutely loved it. I know your perception of New Zealand at that time, because I've heard the story before, uh, <laughs> and it was based off a movie. Tell us about that. Okay, yeah. So it, it was in uh, this was in uh, the season of '99, and uh, once the Warriors had just actually been released. I think it was 98 that it came out. So I've, I'd watched the movie and then when they said, oh, you go over and sign with the Warriors, I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, once for Warriors. So me, over the story goes, me, David Miles and Scotty Cox, and we all uh, flew over on the same flight. We were all coming together, one from um, North Queensland, I think, and the other one was from uh, Newcastle. And uh, we all kind of met at the airport and we flew over. Um, we stayed in a hotel in Mangani and uh, out near the airport somewhere there. And uh, we flew over on a Monday, um, and Tuesday was Melbourne Cup Day. So we um, we all went, went, oh, we'll go down the local pub where the TAB is, put our bets on for Melbourne Cup, you know, have a few beers, and then we'll head home, watch the Melbourne Cup. We get down there, and the first thing I saw when we walked in was a crate of beer sitting up on the on the counter, like once for Warriors, and we're like, let's get out of here, man. We are scared. So we uh, put our bets on and bolted back to the hotel, and, uh, and we're like, oh, my God. My first impressions of New Zealand was like, oh, it's got to be like uh, once we're Warriors, but it obviously is not. Uh, what was it like, that winning feeling uh, when you're playing for the Warriors, and, and how did you enjoy that, you know, the songs that played as, at the end, Loyal and, and everything else? Yeah, mate, it was, it's real strange. When I got over there in, at the end of 99, 2000, it was still Tai Nui owned. It was still Auckland Warriors, not New Zealand Warriors and things like that. So, And Mark Graham was the coach. So, it was uh, and it was and it was tough times. Like we didn't win too many. Uh, I still um, re- remember that the referees. I thought we used to give us a, rub, a bad rub of the green, and that's and I thought it was all talk until I actually was a part of it. And uh, and uh, and we were getting we we're getting some dodgy calls. So um, and then um, to move into the, the um, 2000 2001 with the Auckland Warriors, Daniel Anderson and all that. Um, yeah, like, the, like you said, the winning and the singing the song and and and, and just um, embracing the fans and the fans were just getting excited and you were just so pumped to go and play, especially at Mount Smart. It was, uh, it was an amazing venue. And I think we spoke about it last week with Owen Goodenbill. Uh, the Sandpit on a Monday morning, 8 a.m. with Ando when he was uh, a little bit annoyed with that performance on the Sunday. Your, your memories of that? Oh, a, a very um, a bad. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was our punishment. And uh, you knew you were in trouble when they mentioned the word sandpit. And um, it was uh, it was tough. You're making massive collisions and things like that. But it was dirty. You'd have sand everywhere. Uh, my One of my memories from the sandpit was uh, Frank Paul Nuasala was a young kid, 18-year-old, uh, absolutely bloody bulletproof. Him and also the late Sonny Fye, um, those guys coming in as 18-year-olds and just ripping and tearing through us forwards. And we were all kind of, you know, 100-game uh, NRLers going, mate, settle down. And they were just ripping shreds off us. So, uh, yeah, the, the Sam Peters brings back a few nightmares, mm. actually. What about with Mark Graham? And, um, like, there was that morning we got in there, there was not many balls around. There was no balls around. There was plenty of boxing gloves. Uh, and uh, oh. as Arwen does, he goes up to the coach and says, what are we trying to learn from this uh, session? What's the, the outcomes you want to achieve? He goes, nothing. You, what do you remember of that? Because I remember a couple of good dust-ups that you had. Yeah, well, there was actually uh, there was a guy that I don't know if many of the supporters knew. He didn't. I don't think he pl- went on and played first grade. Vai Kalolo, um, he was a local, um, like a... Uh, Bataka type player uh, for many years and uh, I was I, I faced this guy and I'd only kind of just met everyone I'd only been there a couple of months kind of in the off season and he just punched holes through me and then I uh, then Henry Farfilly came he had a chop at me as well and I'm like what the what's going on here no, he was enough. good until he got time Hens- right he was good until he got Hens- tired. He had like, all the moves this, mate. Yeah, come he out. had all the moves and then he got tired and then you fixed them up which was hard to watch yeah, well, I'd had enough. I've been punched bloody holes through me by Vi, and then Henry Farfilly come out like a bloody wrecking ball. And then I, so once he he settled down a little bit, then yeah, I come into my own and I got a little bit of payback on a winger. But um, mm. yeah, those days with Mark Graham, we used to bloody do four hundreds and things like that. And Mark Graham be on the sideline with the smoking and out of his mouth laughing at us all um, struggling. So mate, yeah, those were those were the days, you know. Yeah, um, you did the consequences. You worked hard and. I was always at the back chasing all you fit buggers, but um, uh, we got it done. Daniel Anderson, someone that you had experienced previously in the reserve grade there at Parramatta Eels. That relationship you had with Ando, because you had trained a little bit more than most. Yes, that's the story of my life, mate. I um, 
I've had to train hard my whole life because I like food, mate. And uh, I had a bad relationship with food, to be honest. And uh, I just thought uh, if I eat more, I just train more and we're all good. So um, if I knew kind of now what I knew, knew then what I know now about food and training, um, the sky would have been the limit for me. But I honestly uh, and just enjoyed um, – I just enjoyed food, and I and I and I was training that much. I just thought I didn't need to uh, worry too much about a diet as such until Daniel Anderson fined me uh, ten thousand uh, dollars one off season. Uh, I came back. I was under. I, that, I was threatened. Um, I came back uh, overweight. Uh, they fined me five grand, and then if I didn't lose whatever weight it was, I think it was five kilos or something. It was going to be another five grand. So yeah. I copped a, a ten thousand dollar fine, and uh, I got it. I got it slightly under control there for a little while. And but every single day, I'd walk in to training. I'd have to drop my bag and jump on the scales. And Ando would normally be waiting there for me. Me being the smart front rower I used to be, um, I used to uh, go to the gym in the morning before training, sit in the sauna, have a sweat, go ride the bike or do a five k row on the rower machine then come to training and get flogged or do whatever we did at training. Um, and then I would sometimes go after training back to the pool on the way home and have a swim or something like that as well, just to try and keep my weight down to keep them happy. Um, so I'd be a, a false light for a long, for probably the first three or four days of the week. Uh, wow. And then at the back end of the week, I'd kind of carbo load back up and have a, you know, drink a lot more water and just get myself ready for the game. So and, that, and now that I look back on it, they were right. I was at my best when I was kind of sitting just under 115 kilo. I was yeah. I was light enough to get around the field, um, but I was heavy enough to still bounce, bounce and um, you know bump and offload and run and that type of thing. So um, once I got up 118 kind of to 120, I was just carrying that little bit, uh, a little bit too much. How do you carry 120 kgs on nine US uh, in terms of your feet? What, what size are you? Nine size nine? I only got a very small. Um, you know what they say about people with small feet, Monty? Yes, I do. I've heard you say this many they times. They have small socks. Small <laughs> oh, socks. I, I thought it was shoes, brother. <laughs> and they sort of had a lot of systems uh, which kept you accountable, and none more so than the point system in the game. Uh, so every action or non-action you have on the field, you get a plus or a minus score, right? And that was something that you brought back from Parramatta, and it was new for us. Uh, Labor intensive. Uh, because like everything you did, if you didn't push up um, in support, if you did push up in support, if you made a tackle but it wasn't a winning tackle as opposed to uh, a losing tackle, talk to us about that system and how long had that been involved in Parramatta because it was, it was huge. We'd all used to run there on a Monday morning and, and see who scored what. Yeah, mate. Well, in this day and age, it's very similar to Supercoach. That, that thing they do online, you know, where you get you're getting points for all your actions, but you're also getting negative points for your for your minus actions, for your errors, penalties, and all that type of thing. So yeah, we, that, that, it's a very good system. And since retiring, I, and I've done some coaching, I've actually used the same system. It just makes you accountable for every action, and mm. um, and you compete on the daily every week against your score. So it beca- yeah, it does kind of become um, you're doing a hit up to get a two, two points as a really good hit up and stuff like that. But it also makes you accountable. So at the end of the game, you might have thought you actually went all right, but your score's not telling you you did. So you might have made some really good tackles, but you didn't make 20 or 30 tackles. So you only made a couple of really good ones, and then you might have missed five. Mm. Uh, so that's where your score actually would would, would uh, be, be smaller. And uh, and honestly, when I was only getting, I only got um, maybe 25, 30 minutes uh, a game sometimes. And if my actions weren't, uh, if I didn't have a high work rate or the action didn't come to me, I could have had a negative score. And I actually did get a couple of negative scores. You know, I made maybe five tackles but missed three. Um, and, you know, I had a couple of carries but not, not post-line contact metres and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, it was definitely tough. Um, uh, but, again, it's an accountability thing, mate. You come off the field and uh, the coaches can – and even now, mate, they've got the GPS stuff there. They can mm. they can monitor – um, and st- and puts that on bloody everything at the moment. Tex, I never forget when Ando came in with Kempi and everyone else and we'd just be running up and down the field and we're first graders, some of us had played international football and we were just passing to the left, passing to the right, going up and down the field for what seemed like hours sometimes. 
uh, and then what was an early catch? Uh, can, you, can you talk to me about early catches and, and the importance of that for the people at home? Because obviously those were huge uh, skill sets that helped us play a, a brand of football that was loved. Yeah, absolutely. And the six o'clock pass was the other one there where the ball doesn't move. It just floats straight through the air, um, tip to the sky, tip to the ground. That kind of help you catch the ball cleanly earlier. The sooner you're, if you're reaching out towards the ball, um, then you're going to get the ball in your hands quicker, which gives you more time to then do what you do. So that's what... Um, that's what the Andrew Johnses and uh, the Jonathan Thurston's used to do, Stacey Jones even. They always say, oh, they've got so much more time, but they don't have more time. Mm. They just get the ball in their hands earlier. And when that, once they got their ball in their hands earlier, then you've got that split second to make a, a better decision, whether you tip on, whether you carry, you know, and that type of thing. So yeah. Show us a W, catch, mate. Show us a W. It was a W, right? The W, the W. <laughs> so, yeah, no, that might be Early catch. Hands. You, you catch that ball, w. you get that ball into your hands straight away, and from it there is. you pass yeah. straight away. So there's no bubbles. Yeah. You don't have to yeah, catch it. You don't right. have to bring it out straight away. And then from that W as well, yeah. you don't have the sausage grip. So what's the no sausage, sausage grip? grip. You got your sausage grip there. is when you're I gripping the ball that. like that. That's right, yeah. I teach the kids now to make a bit of a diamond. Um, so they can look through that diamond to get that early catch. Uh, that's yeah. kind of that's kind of the way I teach it now with the with the young young kids. So when you think about that brand of football we played through the early two thousand, um, this sort of stuff, catching that ball early, being able to promote it, hold that ball, pull it out, bring it back. Uh, Ali Lautiri, hundred offloads in, in one oh, game. All these other guys who understood um, that the con games, knowing the combos that you've got there, that was all down to the skill sets that we that we learned from, yes, there was flamboyant in there, but from, from Daniel Anderson as well, right? Absolutely. And the flamboyancy come from the be able to grip the ball and, and the passing up and down the field for 100 hours a bloody year on learning how to catch and pass, which we should have known when we we're in under sevens. But it was just really reiterating the consequences and the accountability that you need to catch that ball mm. properly, transfer the ball. Once you nail that part, then we can be flamboyant. Ali Lautidis, uh, Sione Farmawina, those guys used to just flick it out of their yeah. asses, and um, you know, and they could, uh, and and we could get away with that. It wasn't considered by us as flamboyant. Yeah. It was actually uh, just offloading and playing off the cuff football. So. In the old days when we played, you know, the, the idea was to train hard, play hard, party hard. Um, but obviously Ando brought something new to the club, um, uh, which was pioneering, uh, and it was from that day. So what, what was that in terms of putting a stop to all the parties? Yes, uh, unfortunately they brought in the, um, the alkalizer, alkalizer test. Um, so, and again, it came, I, was at, I was at Parramatta when Brian Smith brought it in. It was to stop players turning up to train and um, intoxicated or even driving to training still drunk from the night before. So and it was this more was of a safety after mechanism. a win. This is not just during the week, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. After uh, yeah, the next game after. So, um, yeah, Daniel Anderson brought that in at the Warriors and um, and it was, again, just so we, we didn't um, drink while we are like, drink too much and still be hungover by the time we drove to training the next day or... We started getting very scientific at the back end when we were there months, and um, the recovery uh, we had the fly, so no no mm. alcohol. If you said 0.06, that means you could drink how many beers? Oh, 0.05 is the, the limit, and uh, mate, you could have two beers. Um, and back in those days, two beers wasn't worth it, mate. So <laughs> <laughs> you either had six beers or you just drank water, mate. And uh, yeah, or well, sometimes you're like Brent Webb, who just you know, from a, being a Brisbane boy himself, uh, get told there was a yeah, number yes. of, of, of of offenders, but he had that big win over in Brisbane, and then Webby, what did he, what did he breathe when it was a point oh six? Yeah, so I went home. I, I, we went back to Brisbane, so I went home and visited my family, and just you know, spent time with my mum and my dad and that type of thing. And then I come back in the morning to get my bag to get on the plane, and Webby was in. He's my roomie. He was in the. In, uh, in, in the doorway eating pizza with uh, denim jeans on um, and he was absolutely a mess. He just chipped and chased over Darren Lockyer and against the Broncos and we beat him and he's gone back home to have a drink with his mates and I'm like, Webby, what are you doing, mate? So I got him dressed and we got him down to the foyer and uh, I, I hit him over the back 
to keep him away from Daniel Anderson, all our trainers and that. And uh, they ended up getting him. And I think he blew point one, two, three and set a club record or something like that. But uh, I don't know. How he got. I think he got a bit of a, a bit of a, a razzin. But um, in, yeah, that was just uh, one of the stories. There's plenty uh, that tried to cheat the uh, breathalyzer, but it, uh, it doesn't work. How about that? Because you mentioned we got a little bit scientific in terms about flying and trying to be in the best possible, um, you know, health we can be in and recovery and all sorts but um some of the ways they're trying to cheat the breath test um like oh. henry farfili who was trying to blow into the breathalyzer uh but he wasn't actually blowing they were saying blow blow and he yeah he's holding <laughs> his breath he was just holding his breath in in so many others or well, there was yeah. there was the thoughts that if some you of them were food, out there was also yeah i think it was uh, francis melly or someone was blowing out their nose and trying to hold their breath in their mouth and all sorts of things. They'll eat and chewing gum or um, having breath mints or something like that. But uh, no, nah, it never, it never worked, mate. And you see the likes of Johnny Famoina, you see Clinton Torpy, you see Webby, you see Ali Lawatiti. What would you think back then? Yeah, it's, mate, it's, it's really funny. Like, we had confidence when, when Stacey Jones was putting his boots on in the sheds with us, we had confidence that we're a chance today. Were, were we going to win? No, nah, we don't know. But we had, a, we were confident. And, and that's what those kind of players are. Uh, bring um but even though in the in the sheds though, a lot of people don't understand back in the day like we all they're, they're all got the earphones in now but there was music going in the sheds while rungi corpu was having a sleep under the bench someone else was having a shower there's 10 of us up in the grandstand so it was all helter skelter and but we all knew that we had to be in dressed ready for a captain for the coach's uh, address by 20 minutes before warm-up or 10 minutes before warm-up and all that type of thing. Nowadays, mate, they take vitamins at 2.34. They do their stretch bands at 2.40. You know, they're doing all this scientific stuff, which is which is great, but um, mm. I don't know if like, that's the best preparation for an individual. Well, Tooks, once a warrior, always a warrior, and I want to thank you for your time on the field and off the field and, and look at you still representing uh, the, the club now, mate. No doubt you've got a few words you'd like to say to uh, the supporter base because in terms of being uh, a favourite and you actually loving them, uh, that was a huge part of uh, your career. Yeah, mate, I'd, I'd just like to thank every single one of them. Uh, walking into Mount Smart Stadium uh, and, um, you know, and high-fiving, shaking hands... Uh, talking to the fans, uh, that was the highlight of my my career. We'd head up to the Mad Butcher's Lounge and he'd take the piss out of you or, you know, and tell you what you did good, what you did bad. The fans would ask you questions. You'd have a beer with a couple of them. Um, you know, the way the fans and the cult hero and all that type of jazz that, you know, the people of New Zealand uh, embraced me, mate. Well, that was Mark Tukey this week, but next week on the show, we've got someone who played for the club 301 times. That's right, it is the legend that is Simon Mannering. And a lot of people are saying, where is he? What is he up to? Is he even doing anything in terms of being around the great game of rugby league? Well, it's time you find out next week. Same time, same place on Once a Warrior. Straight up the middle, Mark Tukey. It's like Lazo in his prime. Turns it in for Tukey. Tukey's over. The New Zealand Warriors are into the grand final. Kuki, he's big and he got through a very small gap. Look at him go.